Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? <coughs> Joining me here is Mike Vaughn from Venmo. Mike was employee number six at uh, Venmo. And I wanted to start out by asking Mike, when you think about when Venmo was founded, how has the world changed and what's different now compared to when Venmo was founded? How does that impact the way you think about the future of the business? Because you guys were, you know, this was like around just after the iPhone had come out. And if you think back to those early days, um, it's very, you know, very different. Yeah. Well, one thing is now it's all of a sudden cool to be in P2P payments. And back then it was not as cool. I can tell you from going around and raising money and people are like, well, why does the world need Venmo? Like, why can't you use one of these other services? Are people going to really want to share, be social with their payments? And people really did not get the concept. So I think the world is coming around both to mobile payments, especially in the US. Um, I think we had to get over a hurdle of, do I really trust this kind of platform and service? Um, and thinking about how payments used to be very, um, and still is in a lot of cases, um, sort of utilitarian. And it was just like, I, got, I have to move money. And there's a lot more going on around a payment that we think about that I think the the rest of the sort of uh, ecosystem is starting to better understand how that all can play together. And I think the consumer you know, world is starting to sort of uh, trust it more and, and come along and sort of see the opportunities and what it can do for them. But it's also become a lot easier for other people, like banks, um, just to throw one out there, to get into payments. I mean, the, um, you guys have a competition today in a way that wasn't true right. when Venmo started out. and Banks have the advantage that they already know my bank account number. They already know a lot about me. So are they? Are you worried that they're coming after you now? And how are you going to fight that threat? So uh, the way I think about that is we're, we're always paying attention to the competition. Like, it would be silly not to. So when you, when you look at what's coming after you, you want to pay attention to it, what they're doing that's different. Um, but at the same time, you want to stay focused on what you're doing. Right, and not chasing everybody who's coming after you and, and trying to be sort of the me too of what everybody else is doing. I think that's very dangerous in terms of like losing track of, of what matters to what you're doing. So we stay very focused on the Venmo experience. I think one thing that has happened is the more um, opportunities there are and there are the more ways that people have to use, in this case, use their phone to pay for things or send money, I think the more comfortable the entire sort of uh, consumer um, population becomes with the concept. So when you're the first in that space, you have to educate and teach everybody, right? And, and you have to get everybody over that hurdle. And I think the more they see other people doing it and other options for doing it, it gives them choice, which is good. It keeps us sort of hustling and, and sort of, uh, you know, making sure that we stay competitive. And in, you know, there's a little bit of that, you know, the, the rising sort of tide raises all the boats, which I think is generally a good thing to bring the sort of whole industry along. But what is it about Venmo that's really going to be sticky? Like what's going to keep people using Venmo even when it's City or Chase or whoever can kind of offer a similar function? So I think um, people use Venmo, uh, one, it's simple, it's easy, it's fast. It's not unique in that way. It is more social um, in, in the sense that um, it has a, it's, it's entirely focused on a mobile experience and it's entirely focused on, you know, how do we make the money movement as seamless and as easy as possible? But when you think about when you pay for things, whether you're paying your friend back or you're buying something, the money movement itself is not the important thing for us. What, the way we think about it is, it's what's happening around it that's important, so the experience. So we talk a lot about um, a payment experience and a payment story. The money movement happens. We have to do that quickly. It has to be secure. It has to be safe. It has to be reliable. But that's the carrier for sort of the more important thing, which is the experience. Why am I paying my friend back? It's because we're going on a trip together, or we're buying a gift for somebody, or we went out to dinner. And it makes it easier to sort of connect to the things that matter most to you. And so the, the money is sort of the vehicle for the rest of the experience. And I think that's one of the big things that um, differentiates Venmo. And as you sort of, the, in your question, talking about the stickiness of it, I think people just find that experience to be something that resonates with them that's different than sort of the utilitarian aspect of go in and just move money around. 
So in that way, is it, you guys share some traits with like Snapchat, for example. Snapchat circa 2014. You know, growing fast, popular with millennials, very social. People are kind of addicted to it. But how could you avoid like Snapchat 2017 where, you know, there's a plateau and, and adoption only goes so far. Like, how do you avoid kind of the, the growth challenges that Snapchat's dealing with today? So I think one is you have to sort of be looking forward at what do our customers want. And for, for Venmo, the key is what are all the ways, take what people love about Venmo today and why it's been growing like crazy and we have the, you know, sort of the user base and the engagement that we've built over the last, you know, five plus years. What is it about that experience that they, that they enjoy that's different than what they can get from other sort of services? And then where else would they find that you know, experience to be something that adds value? And so some of the things we're doing with taking it out of what we call peer-to-peer -peer or the P2P payment space where you're paying your friends back uh, and sending back money back and forth uh, with, with other people that you know is now you can, um, you know, we recently launched the ability for you to use your Venmo account to pay any, you know, up, there's more than 2 million PayPal merchants in the U.S. and you now can pay those PayPal merchants with your Venmo account. One of the benefits of being part of sort of the PayPal family. Um, in native apps with Braintree, who's also part of that family, we have apps like Poshmark and Delivery.com and others where you can use Venmo, which is inherently a very mobile experience inside of other native apps. So if you're ordering um, with your roommates through delivery.com and you have that experience, it becomes a seamless sort of more, you know, more enjoyable experience and easier experience to buy delivery food and split it with your roommates uh, mm -hmm. right inside the app. So we're starting to sort of expand the ways that you can use Venmo. So will it be like the experience of, you know, ordering food will drive the Venmo use? Or is it more like the use of Venmo will drive the food ordering? Like, yes. how, how, which direction? All. Does, okay. <laughs> All of the above. So, you know, we're not using the merchant platforms to acquire Venmo users. We, okay. And to the point that, like, inside, a, inside an app like Poshmark or Delivery.com, if you don't use Venmo, we won't show you a Venmo button. So we're not trying to use the merchant's platform to gain Venmo users. We're trying to bring Venmo users to the merchant platform and create a, um, you mentioned the stickiness, to create an, uh, an experience that is stickier and creates a more loyal customer. It's easier, a higher conversion rate. So it's, it's much more than just another button in the flow. It's an experience that ties back into Venmo. And so they get the benefit of sort of creating that connection between you as the merchant and the consumer. And then the current Venmo experience where you can split and share um, with your friends in that so, sort of social aspect, it brings the two together with a very simple, easy integration, but is all about us bringing Venmo users to the merchant experience as opposed to the other way around. Which is so interesting because that's kind of the opposite of the way a lot of the big payment systems in the world worked. I mean, if you look at PayPal, right. it was really driven by eBay <clears throat> in the early days. Right. You know, in China, you had WeChat Pay, kind of driven by the ride-hailing adoption. Uh, um, so, would, like, would that will that ever change? You seem very, very determined that, like, uh, I, you, you wouldn't. So I think there is there are so many payment buttons and options out there, and everybody's got a version of it. And the last thing we want to be is a, another button that's just like every other button. We have to bring something else to the table. We don't want to, you know, leverage their, everything they've done to build a customer base to get Venmo customers. We want to bring something else to the table. And for us, we've spent, and, and people have been wondering, how, what's Venmo going to do next? When are they going to start connecting to merchants? When are they going to do X, Y, or Z? If you look at how we've gotten to here, we've spent a long time building this um, P2P experience because we thought it was so important to get to that user base that got, has that level of comfort with using their phone to pay for things. And then at the right point where we have, you know, a, what we thought was a critical mass of, of users and engagement, then bring that out to the merchants. And we've been very deliberate with that. And, and I think there is, you can always go faster and you can always push it faster, but we've been very deliberate about making sure that when we do bring that to the merchants, that it's something where we're bringing all the value to the table. And so we've, 
I think we've taken a lot longer to get there than, than maybe some other companies might have, but that was intentional to get the user base to a point where we thought, okay, we're ready for it in terms of size, engagement, trust, and how they interact with the platform to start bringing that to the merchant. So we're, we're adding all the value. And is that part of the reason Venmo hasn't integrated with like PayPal's P2P services? Because you guys are still separate. I mean, as a user, <coughs> for me, it feels like to totally right. two different distinct products. So I think we did, so one of the things we're doing is, I, it's almost like we get, to, we get the benefit being part of PayPal to sort of, um, it, in a lot of ways it goes both directions, but we have the ability to sort of cherry pick where the PayPal and Braintree, for that matter, platforms can benefit the ben Venmo platform. So there are a lot of things we do behind the scenes where we, we leverage technology and operations and, and sort of PayPal's been around for um, a couple decades building this intelligence and building the scaling and the security. We get the benefit of that um, and we get to pick and choose where do our users want that experience. And today, we felt the, the, the thing that was in most demand was, I want more ways to use Venmo outside of sending money back and forth to my friends. So we started with this idea of, I want to be able to pay merchants. We've tested a card uh, that's in beta right now where you have a, a debit card, essentially a prepaid card attached to your Venmo account. So now, not only is it um, in the online world and mobile through uh, PayPal and Braintree, but now I can use a card um, that we expect to roll out more broadly next year. If I have money in my Venmo balance, uh, my, I'm at college, my mom sends me money, it's in my Venmo balance, instead of just paying my friend back for the pizza we ordered, now I can go use it anywhere a credit card or debit card's accepted. We really were looking for ways to um, give our user base something they really wanted. And so mm -hmm. we started there. Now, that's not to say we won't do those other things down the road, but we really wanted to pick the ones that mattered most. But with things like prepaid debit cards, I mean, it feels a little bit like you guys are becoming more like the banks, and the banks are also becoming more like, m more, more like you. I mean, where does that, where does that end? Would, would Venmo ever provide personal financial advice or services, fi banking services? I, I, I won't say never. Um, I, it's not something we're focused on right now. If you see on the PayPal side, they launched something recently with, with Acorns, which is sort of take your PayPal balance and invest it through, through Acorns. Um, so there are ways to do things like that. Right now, Venmo is pretty focused on the P2P and what we call sort of bucket in, in the commerce experience and that social experience. Um, when we think about the debit card, it's, it's sort of like people will come to us and say, well, isn't that going a little backwards? Isn't Venmo trying to get rid of things like cash and card? And the reality is cards aren't going away anytime soon. I don't imagine they'll be gone in our lifetime or maybe our kid's lifetime or grandkid's <laughs> lifetime. What we want is what is it about Venmo that's unique and how do we bring that experience to other places where you use your money? And the reality is cards are a big use of where people spend their money. And so if we can bring something about the Venmo experience to that, that's a good thing. If we think that Venmo doesn't add a whole lot of value and you get that service somewhere else where the Venmo experience doesn't you know, improve on it, then we're not, going to, we're not going to do that. So I think, I won't say we never do all of those things, but I think we're very, um, we're very intentional and very deliberate about making sure we're doing something that adds some value or changes the experience in a way that, that is positive for, for our users. So you've mentioned a couple ways that Venmo is going to, to eventually make money. I think right now it's not really broken out from PayPal, but it's safe to say that it doesn't seem like it's profitable based on my assumptions. Um, so, but you've mentioned the debit card, you've mentioned the merchant deals. Um, these are all paths to profitability. How long is that process gonna take? I mean, do you have a deadline in mind? <laughs> um, it is, we're, we're focused, it's a very long plan. It's like a long, not long plan, long, it, we're playing the long game, right? We're, we're, not, we're not after like how do we, how do we turn a profit on this thing next week, next one, month, next quarter, if that's going to jeopardize what we think is a massive, like sort of industry changing opportunity. The same way PayPal came along in you know, late 90s, early 2000s and changed the way online commerce happened and is now continuing to do that through online and mobile, we think Venmo has a place over the next 10, 20, 30 years 
this is not a one to three year plan. This is a you know, 10, 20, 30 year, 50 year plan um, where we want people looking back and talking about Venmo as something that completely disrupted and, and changed the industry. Um, the, you know, the way we think about profitability and how to, you know, how to um, contribute to the bottom line of, of PayPal through the Venmo platform is we want to build things that our Venmo community finds interesting and valuable, whether that's our customers, our users, the consumers, the merchants, the brands, however we create that engagement. And when those things also create um, revenue, that's a, that's a win. We're not going to find something that creates revenue and then force it on our users. And that's, the, that's backwards. And if you have trouble finding things that add value, that make money, eventually that's gonna be a problem. But we have you know, the, the commerce stuff, we have a lot of other things we're thinking about that we think adds value first and creates revenue for us. That's the way we think about it, not go find any way we can make money and ram it down our user's throat is not really the, the strategy. Okay, well as a Venmo user myself, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I want to ask a little more about this 10, 20, 50 year plan. Um, uh, I was based in China for many years as a, a journalist, so I got to see the rise of digital payments there and how digital payments were adopted so much more quickly than they were in the US. Mm -hmm. I mean, you literally never need cash walk in, in Beijing or Shanghai or any major city. Um, what do you see as the barriers to digital payment adoption in the US and like a sort of systemic level? I mean, how come I still have to use cash at my corner store? <laughs> uh, I don't know about the sort of systemic uh, sort of origin of those barriers, but we do see very different sort of ways of interacting, one with your money and, and even even in the mobile space of how apps work and, and how people interact with apps, the way they um, most uh, users interact with apps in the US, for example, is very different than in some of the Asian markets where you might use one of those apps as sort of your go-to for everything. It's like I buy my tickets there, I send my messages there, I you know, pay my bills there. And in, in, in other markets, everything is very um, distributed and very specific, where this app's for this, this app's for this. And I think, I think we, um, part of that is you, to, to succeed in all those markets, obviously Venmo today is US only. PayPal's a global company providing services uh, you know, all around the globe. You have to sort of adapt to each of those markets um, and make sure you're sort of meeting the, that that user base and, and that community in the way that they want to interact with the experience. Um, and I think there is something about the, the U.S. that's playing a little bit of, a, of, of catch up to, to other markets in the world, but I think we're, we're, we're getting there finally. All right, so it's time to play overrated or underrated. Um, I have 10 words written here. And um, tell me if you think they are overrated or underrated. Number one is the topic du jour, Bitcoin. Underrated. What? <laughs> How many of you guys think Bitcoin is underrated right now? Can I see a show of hands? Interesting, definitely the minority. Okay, so about four people in the audience agree with you, so can you explain? Um, I, I think it's going to, it has the potential to be one of those moments where we look back, and right now it feels like we're on this point in the curve. You know, whether you're talking about price or sort of how it's used or how, you know, how it reaches its, its market potential, it could be something that at this point in the curve, you know, 10 years from now, looks like it's way down here. So I, I just think it, it's one of those moments where you can't really see it when it's happening, but feels like there's, there's something that, need, that will happen and that I believe will happen in, in this cryptocurrency that it, it's not necessarily about the price point or the valuation or the spike in the price of Bitcoin and these others, um, but it's really about the, the game-changing aspect of the way money moves and sort of tears down all the barriers of, of fees and other things that I think there's something there. Is it in its exact form? Is it Bitcoin? I don't know, but it, there, there's something there that, that starts to break down the sort of the difficulty and the delays and the fees and the, you know, the complexity of moving money around um, you know, across the globe, I think there's something there. So is Venmo gonna start accepting Bitcoin? Uh, Venmo's focused on what Venmo's doing today, so. 
That was a very vague answer. All right, well, we've got to rush through the, the remaining nine words uh, since we're running out of time. Blockchain. Same. Number three, AI. Uh, a little overrated. Number four, Facebook. Perfectly rated. <laughs> Number five, Apple Pay. Pass. <laughs> It's a sensitive one, I guess. Okay, no, number no six, comment. <laughs> autonomous cars. Uh, underrated. Number seven, Uber. Mm, that's a tough one. Underrated. All right. Number eight, American Express. Uh, well, mm, I think... I know your boss used to work there, so this might be a little yeah, delicate question. But I don't know that... I think, I think the way people are thinking about it is uh, they kind of knocked it down probably more than it should be in terms of like the, the public sentiment about it right now. So I guess that makes it underrated. What about Square? <clears throat> underrated. And number 10, Zelle. <laughs> well, so... People aren't saying a lot of nice things about it, so it's, I'm not going to say it's, I think, yeah. I'll take a pass on <laughs> Next. That's it. <laughs> All right, please join me in a round of applause for Mike. Thanks, guys. <laughs>